One year prior to the 2018 midterm elections, registered voters in Missouri received this postcard telling them that the next time you go to the polls, that you will have to show a government-issued photo ID. For those of us who drive cars, that's not likely to be much of a personal affront. If you own a car, you probably have a driver's license on your person at all times. If you don't own a car, then this is what we call voter suppression. The formula is very simple. Larger voter turnouts tend to favor Democratic candidates. Smaller voter turnouts tend to favor Republican candidates. Now, in a true democracy, everyone votes, right? Every person gets a vote. Well, what is everyone? Or who is everyone? When our country was founded, everyone was white men. That's the only people that got to vote. In 1870, there was an amendment to the Constitution after the Civil War that gave black men the right to vote, although southern states did everything they could from literacy tests to poll taxes to make sure that black men didn't actually vote. Fifty years after black men were given the vote, after years of protests and demonstrations, many of which were broken up violently by police and there were multiple arrests, by 1920, women were given the right to vote. Our nation was 150 years old, founded on principles of democracy. It still took 150 years, lots of protesting and work for half of the population to be given the right to vote. Voter suppression, especially of black voters, continued right up until the famous protests of the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s that culminated in the 1965 passage of the Voters' Rights Act. Most of us here today can remember some of those events. The events at the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, the Bloody Sunday that March in 1965, when state police and federal troops released dogs on protesters, then rode horses in amongst them, wantonly beating and shooting at demonstrators that were asking for nothing more complicated than the right to vote. It took almost 200 years to actually give birth to a democracy that even looked like what our founders actually envisioned a democracy in which everyone had a right to vote. People worked, bled, protested, and many died to gain the right to participate in self-governance. I understand that Republicans still want to win elections. I personally hope that we maintain a two-party system until we have a three or four or five-party system. I really think we would have a better democracy if we had several active political parties that had at least an opportunity at winning, but we certainly don't want one. We want to see at least two parties survive. But you don't get to win elections by eroding democracy. Republican Party needs to change in ways that develop campaigns that allow them to straight up win an election based on a majority of votes. The current claim that there is rampant voter fraud is itself the ultimate fraud. Justin Levitt, professor of, uh, at uh, the Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, conducted a research project to find out how many instances of legitimate voter fraud have taken place in the United States. Now, Donald Trump claimed that there were more than three million um, instances of voter fraud in the 2016 election. What Justin Levitt discovered is that if you look from the year 2000 to the year 2014, Across the country, in all elections, you can find 31 instances of voter fraud. 31 over a period of 14 years. So even if his research missed a 1,000 instances of voter fraud for every one that he found, it still wouldn't amount to enough to change any election. Voter fraud probably takes place in North America one or two or three times a year. 
There are no substantive issues of voter fraud in America. Still, states are enacting photo ID laws to solve a problem that does not exist, at least in the sense of the problem that they say that they are correcting. Now think about it. Who does not have a government-issued photo ID? People who don't take international uh, trips or vacations, they've got passports, and people that don't own cars. Well, who doesn't own cars and doesn't take international trips? Hmm, I'm guessing poor people. People that uh, live in urban centers that use public transportation. People who are recent immigrants, usually the minorities. Most people with disabilities. So we have about 20 million people who now have to take an extra step to get to vote. So the hope is, at least on the part of those requiring the photo, photo ID requirement, not that there, that has anything to do with voter fraud, it has everything to do with trying to get poor people to not vote because they tend to vote for Democrats. Now we're good people here, I checked as you came in. <laughs> We are not narcissistically only interested in what affects us directly. Voter ID requirements are not going to be any kind of impediment on me or probably on any of you. But we are, or at least we should be, the kind of people who get outraged by anyone having their vote taken away from them, or even just seeing millions of, being manip seeing millions of people being manipulated into not bothering to do the things that they would have to do to be able to vote. But let's imagine for a moment that we were not good people. It'd be a stretch, but think about it. If you were just motivated out of your own personal interest, selfishly speaking, does voter suppression affect those of us who already have a driver's license? Well, yes, it does. It does if you believe in democracy. If you've got any passion about maintaining a democratic state, it affects you. Or if you value our form of government, or if you believe in majority rule, and in fact, if you ever want to see anyone win an election who's not a Republican, it affects you. When 20 million voters who might vote for a progressive candidate are prevented from voting, then my vote is worth significantly less. Now, I care about voters' rights because they were bought with a price. One person, one vote is a bedrock of freedom and democracy, and any attempt at diluting democracy is an assault, should be, on any patriotic American. It's heartbreaking to think that any political party would stoop so low as to insult the, uh, the integrity of voting in order to win elections. I want to bring this down to a concrete application. The state of Wisconsin was one of the first states to enact photo ID laws, or photo ID laws. And they prevented, we think, in the 2016 election, about 50,000 citizens of Wisconsin from voting. Now Trump won Wisconsin, and he won it by 23,000 votes. It is likely that if they did not have a photo ID law, that Trump would not have won Wisconsin. And if he did not win Wisconsin, guess what? He would not have been president of the United States. I, for one, think that that is important to think about. But of course, the photo ID requirements uh, amount to only one way that Republicans are seeking to suppress voters' rights. They're trying to close voting places and are doing it quite successfully in many urban areas. They make the lines longer, they restrict early voting, and they have eliminated weekend voting in many communities with minority populations. Now other nations uh, in Western Europe make their election days national holidays so that everyone is off from work. In America, our voting days are always on a Tuesday, which is a work day, so that business owners, managers, the retired professionals, they don't have any trouble swinging by a voting place during the slow hours and getting to cast their vote. But if you are paid by the hour and you're scheduled to work at Walmart that day, you may not get to vote. If we moved our election days to Saturday or Sunday, it would make voting much more democratic. Interestingly, 
that idea is almost never mentioned. But of all these techniques that uh, are used to suppress votes, they all pale in significance to the real crime of voter fraud, which is gerrymandering. This practice of drawing boundaries of electoral districts to benefit the party that is in power has been going on for 200 years. The term gerrymandering was one of the first political terms coined in the United States. It's been done forever, but with digital information and our ability to know so much about voters and their locations, our ability to gerrymand now is an absolute science. You can draw voting districts to basically determine the outcome. Now, both Republicans and Democrats have been guilty of doing it, but as a percentage of the population that self-identifies as Republican keeps getting smaller and smaller, the remaining Republican-controlled state houses are rigging elections far into the future by twisting and turning district lines for no logical reason, so far as common interests of the voters goes. But it is being done to establish majority Republican districts that can hold on to power for another generation. Electoral districts are defined at the state level. Our state legislature draws those boundaries, but they affect national elections. <clears throat> it's legal, but it's not ethical. It's legal, but it should stop. It amounts once again to taking away not an individual's right to vote, but it takes away the value of the votes of everyone who is not in the majority in that voting district. If 40% of the citizens didn't vote for the winner, their votes become less and less valuable. And if you love democracy, you really ought to be against gerrymandering. And it's just something that hardly bubbles up into the press, but it's terribly important. And I apologize for being wonkish about it, but. If you'll let me tax your patience for just another five minutes, I've got to be even a little more wonkish. Our founding fathers, for reasons that were fairly disingenuous in the 1700s, but for reasons that have become absolutely absurd since the invention of the telegraph, built a monster into our Constitution called the Electoral College. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 creates a way of assigning each state a certain number of electoral college votes based on the population of the state. Now, originally, that was done to provide an extra layer of protection against voters. In case somebody voted for a moron, the electoral college could change the vote and not get that person into office. We have now demonstrated that that doesn't work. Yeah. Now that we have elected an absolute moron, even the Electoral College needs to take another day in court. What is not in the Constitution is any suggestion that every state has to award all of their Electoral College votes to one candidate. For example, last year in Missouri, we, have 10, we had 10 Electoral College votes last year. 60% of our population voted for Trump, 40% voted for Clinton. Logic would dictate that Trump would then get six electoral college votes from Missouri and Clinton would have gotten four. However, in spite of how obvious that is, that's not how states do it. It's obvious except for the fact that states almost always, the majority wants all of the votes to go with the majority vote. So you have uh, all, I think all but two states are winner-take-all states, and even the others are not particularly uh, judicious. So if you're a Democrat who lives in a red state, voting for president is, uh, well, it's kind of an exercise in public protest, but it doesn't count. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the outcome of who gets elected for, for president. Voting for deeply, uh, voting for Democrats in deeply red states, I keep doing it, done it all my life, but it uh, means I almost never get to vote for the winner. It would take an amendment to the Constitution to eliminate the Electoral College, but folks, realistically, in 2017, Amendments to the Constitution are virtually impossible. I mean, it's almost impossible to amend the Constitution these days. 
But that doesn't mean that we're stuck with an electoral college, either through a Supreme Court decision based on a lawsuit or the Congress could mandate that states apportion electoral votes based on the apportionment of the votes in that state, creating, brace yourselves, election by popular vote, as takes place in every other civilized democracy in the world. Now, the premise of this book that I'm working on is that most of what stands between America as it is now and a greater America really isn't all that hard to accomplish. Crucial to the preservation of our free democracy is the right of every citizen to vote. So we need to encourage everyone to vote their conscience, and we need to outlaw gerrymandering and the winner-take-all state practices regarding the Electoral College and these silly voter ID laws, which are really just another form of a literacy test or a poll tax, need to be eliminated across the country. And we should make voting easier. There should be mail-in ballots, there should be weekend voting, there should be easier absentee voting, and I think our election day should be a national holiday. Amen. Now, there are more complicated issues about fair democracies. I mean, we really ought to get money out of politics. And, and I would love for us in the United States to have enforced brief periods of electioneering, maybe three months, and I would love to see uh, prison sentences for candidates who knowingly lie in campaign speeches and ads. And as radical as that sounds, all of those things are already in force in most Western democracies. I mean, Germany learned a lot of lessons from the rise of Hitler. And one of them is, you can't lie to the public in a political ad. England, France, all these other countries have very brief campaign periods. You all know that on the night of our presidential elections, as soon as they have tallied the votes, they start talking about who's going to run the next time. And we are now three years away from our next presidential election, and we are always being treated on a daily basis to people being interviewed asking if they plan to run for president in the next election. Our election cycle is crazy. But all of these changes are difficult, and the premise of my current book project is is let's figure out what we can gather as the low-hanging fruit to move from America as it is now to a much greater America. That's not comprehensive. There are some other things that ought to happen. But my fear is that progressives are inclined towards despair, that we start thinking about what all is wrong to the point that we become inclined to get mad and to give up. I'm saying American greatness is within our grasp, and because of that, cynicism absolutely must not win. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.